Hello, I'm Greg Grinklaw, the developer of SkyTools. In this video, we're going to take an inside look into what goes on behind the scenes to create the current lists in SkyTools. There also may be no better way to expose how unique SkyTools is than to have a peek at the current observing lists. The story begins way back in the mid-1990s when I started writing the code for basic things like plotting the position of a star or a planet. This code is the foundation that SkyTools is built on even today. One day, I figured out how to use osculating orbital elements to plot the position of a comet, which was pretty cool, but I needed to test it. At the time, I was teaching Astronomy 101 classes at a community college in San Diego. And as a San Diego State alum, I had access to a 21-inch telescope at Mount Laguna Observatory. So every few months, I'd print out my charts and head up to the observatory to try them at the eyepiece. It was surprising how many comets were bright enough to be observed. So I set out to chase them down. Now I say chase them down because the term comet hunting has a special meaning. It's reserved for those who hunt for new comet discoveries. Anyhow, what I discovered was perplexing. I'd have 10 comets between 12th and 14th magnitude, and two would be bright and obvious, three would be faint and difficult, and the remaining five would elude my detection, no matter how hard I tried. The weirdest part was that there was only a weak correlation between the magnitude of the comet and whether or not I could detect it. So what was going on? Why were some comets easy and others invisible? It was a mystery. I ruled out the obvious explanations for why I couldn't detect many of those comets based on their magnitude alone, and eventually realized that it had to do with the morphology of the comet. Some comets appear star-like in the eyepiece, and others are much larger and more diffuse. Even if two comets have the same integrated magnitude, the large diffuse comet will be more difficult to detect. For the diffuse comet, it comes down to contrast. Contrast in the eyepiece depends on many factors, including the aperture of the telescope, the brightness of the sky, and the choice of eyepiece. Out of those early tests came two of my passions, comet chasing and learning how to better predict which comets are visible in the eyepiece. By the early 2000s, I had ways to roughly predict which comets would be visible in a telescope by taking into account how large and diffuse they were. Most people were only aware of the bright naked eye or binocular comets that received attention in the magazines. So for kicks, I'd hang out with people at star parties and ask them if they wanted to see a comet in their telescope. Inevitably, they'd say something to the effect that they didn't think there were any comets around at that time. Then I'd show them three or four of them using SkyTools charts that I had prepared ahead of time. In 2005, I wrote an article for Sky and Telescope about comet chasing with the hope that more people would begin to observe telescopic comets. To me, it was just like hunting down deep sky objects, but they moved and could change from night to night. I shared the techniques that I used to better determine which comets might be visible in the eyepiece to improve the odds of seeing any given comet. But things really took off when I was developing SkyTools 3, which included sky brightness and contrast models for the first time. I used these models to predict if a given deep sky object could be detected. Eventually, I also came up with a way to use this model to predict how visible a comet would be in the eyepiece and started publishing my monthly comet chasing webpage, which accurately predicts the telescope aperture required to see each of the comets that month. I made further improvements to the model for SkyTools 4. But in order to use the model successfully, I need data. When observers report a magnitude estimate for a comet, they also estimate the coma diameter, the length of the tail, if there is one, and something called the degree of condensation. The degree of condensation, or DC, is a number between zero and nine. Zero is completely diffuse, with no hint of a bright spot at the center, and nine is completely stellar. Remember, being able to detect a comet in the eyepiece depends on more than just the magnitude. My detection model uses all of this information 
to predict visibility in the eyepiece. This is the app that I've been developing to analyze comet data. It's still under construction, but it's already saving me a lot of time. I used to spend a full day updating the data, generating the current comets observing list for sky tools, and using that information to update my comet chasing website. Now it only takes an hour or so. So what's this all about? In order to determine if a comet is visible, the first thing we have to do is get the magnitude right. Orbits from the Minor Planet Center come with magnitude parameters, which are used to calculate the magnitude of a comet. This is where most websites and apps get their magnitude predictions. But here's a secret. The Minor Planet Center is all about orbits. They don't put a lot of effort into getting the magnitude parameters right. As a result, most apps and websites don't provide accurate magnitudes. Let's have a look at 19P Borelli. Down here are the observations that have been reported. This comet is currently brighter than 10th magnitude, according to the recent estimates. Up here on the top left is a plot of magnitude versus time, going back to September. The dots are actual magnitude estimates. The curve is the magnitude prediction based on the parameters provided by the Minor Planet Center. Now, it's pretty obvious that the curve doesn't fit the points. The curve claims the comet is a full magnitude brighter than it really is. These values here are the magnitude parameters, h and g. I'll adjust the h value downward, and if I bring it down to about 5.8, the curve matches the data. With the corrected parameters, SkyTools can accurately predict the magnitude. I could also have the program calculate the best fit, but this actually looks pretty good. Comets aren't always this consistent, so I keep an eye on recent observations, and if one begins to depart from predictions, I'll publish updated parameters in the current comets list. Let's have a look at 29P. This comet is a mess. It's unique in that it has frequent outbursts, where it suddenly brightens and then fades. I had recently read that it had another outburst, and I'll have to look into that. But Based on the data we have, it looks like it's faded again. Now, my goal here is to predict the magnitude as faithfully as possible for the next several weeks, so I'm not that concerned with fitting the data several months ago. I may just bring it down to here, but I'll need to do more research to make sure more recent data doesn't show a new outburst. This is 67P you can see that it poses some problems too. The peak brightness doesn't coincide with perihelion. Perihelion is the closest approach to the sun, and the date of perihelion is indicated by this yellow line. The orbit of 67P doesn't bring it particularly close to the sun. Even at perihelion, it's farther away than the Earth is. The ones that get closer are usually a lot less well-behaved. Back to 19P. This graph is of the actual diameter of the coma in kilometers over time. The coma is the fuzzy head of the comet. You can see there's a great deal of scatter in the observations, especially in the last month as it approached perihelion. This is as much an art as it is a science, but from experience, I'm going to place the coma diameter, which I can adjust from here, a bit higher. It looks like it has grown consistently since September as it approached the Sun. This next graph is the degree of condensation, or DC. The default DC is 5. I'm going to adjust that to a DC of 4 to better fit the data. The bottom graph shows estimates of the actual tail length, again in kilometers. Here's the current value and that's drawn as the yellow horizontal line here. There is one observation of a much longer tail, but that appears to have been in error. In fact, it's about 19 arc minutes long in the sky. Here's an image I took last night. And this image shows the full extent of the tail better. 
Once these values are set for all the comments that have observations, I can publish an updated current comments list. When this list is imported into SkyTools via your subscriptions, it also imports the magnitude parameters, coma diameter, DC, and tail length data. Let's look up 19p in the comet database. SkyTools keeps separate orbits for each time it appears brightly in our sky, centered on the time of periastron, because the orbit and brightness of the comet can change from one to the next. This comet has an orbital period of only 6.8 years, so there are a lot of past orbits. I'm going to select the most recent one. The magnitude, coma diameter, and tail data is all updated. When SkyTools calculates how the comet will appear in the eyepiece, it uses this information. But more importantly, the combination of magnitude, coma diameter, and DC is used by SkyTools to model the surface brightness of the comet, and that, in turn, is used to model its visual difficulty in your telescope, in SkyTools Visual, and the signal-to-noise ratio that can be achieved in SkyTools Imaging. I also use these observations to create my monthly comet chasing page, which predicts the aperture required to detect a comet from a reasonably dark site at various latitudes. A few other websites can tell you the current magnitude of a comet based on actual observations, but remember, that doesn't translate directly to whether or not you can see it in a given telescope. And it bears repeating that all but the most devoted comet websites, and to my knowledge all other software, merely pass on the magnitude parameters from the Minor Planet Center, which are not reliable. For SkyTools, the point of all this is to solve the problem that I experienced years ago when I can only find four or five out of every 10 comets based on their magnitude alone. SkyTools users can plan to observe telescopic comets with confidence that they can be detected in their telescope. If you have never tried comet chasing, which is the visual observation of telescopic comets as if they're moving deep sky objects, I urge you to give it a try on some dark night. There's usually one or two comets visible in a six inch scope on any given night and many more in larger instruments. Lastly, it needs to be said that none of this would be possible without the ongoing observations made by dedicated amateur astronomers. Each of these data points required effort. Every comet chaser owes them a debt of gratitude. SkyTools also provides a current bright and interesting minor planets list. What this mainly consists of is minor planets that are at opposition this month and magnitude 12.5 or brighter. When a minor planet is at opposition, that means it is opposite the sun, so it's high in the sky near midnight. This is a quick way to determine if a minor planet is well placed for observation from the Earth, and it's also usually when they are at their brightest. The result is a list of asteroids for casual observers that are easily observed this month. Bright, close approaching asteroids are also included, and I add some faint challenging minor planets that are unusual in some way, maybe because they are dwarf planets or very distant. This process is now entirely automated. Finally, there's the current novae and supernovae list. The supernovae in this list are updated automatically once every day. I keep track of the novae manually by maintaining the latest data in a file. A nova is a star that suddenly becomes bright for many months at a time. Most novae are in our own galaxy. They are composed of two stars, one of which is a white dwarf. Most novae occur when matter from the second star is dumped onto the white dwarf, causing ignition. A supernova is a much brighter event, having to do with the end of life of a massive star or a white dwarf. There have been supernovae in our own galaxy, and they can be so bright as to be seen in daytime. But most supernovae are spotted in faraway galaxies, appearing as a star brighter than all the others in the galaxy. These are intensely studied because they're used as so-called standard candles to measure the distance to galaxies. We need accurate distances to galaxies to study the expansion of the universe. Most supernovae are discovered in automated surveys. The magnitudes are reported at this website. A typical supernova 
will brighten very quickly, then fade slowly over many months. There can very quickly be many thousands of them. This creates a problem. Who wants to have their charts cluttered up with supernovae that have long since faded? I suppose we could just delete them after a while. But what if you took an image or logged an observation and years later wanted to make a chart showing where the supernova was? What SkyTools does to alleviate this problem is to keep track of the observations reported of each supernova or nova. Depending on the type, these objects fade over time in a predictable way. So with a few observations and knowing what type of nova or supernova it is, SkyTools can fit a typical light curve, which is a graph of the brightness of a star over time, and use that to predict the brightness in the past or future. As long as we know the type and have a few data points, we can match one of these curves and predict the magnitude at any time. Here's an example of Supernova 2022ABQ. These are magnitudes that have been reported. If I plot it on the atlas, we can see it at magnitude 16.3, which is bright enough to see in a large daub. I'll time step forward by 30 days at a time and it slowly fades from view. This is how we keep these objects from cluttering the charts and to give you a decent idea of how bright it is when you go to observe it. So now check this out. Here's the Crab Nebula, which was the result of a supernova in our own galaxy in the year 1054. I'll set the time step to 100 years and start going back in time. You can see some of the closer stars moving as I click due to proper motion. And there, it's 1054 and we see a supernova. If I go back further in time, there's no star or nebula. Moving ahead again, the star appears, then fades, and eventually we see only the nebula. If you've never tried it, why not try adding a supernova that's visible in your telescope to your observing from time to time. Load up the current Novi supernovae list and pick one that's detectable. Here is supernova 2022 FW in the galaxy NGC 4348 in Virgo. That would make a nice view in a larger scope or a nice image with the galaxy in the background. In fact, here's an image I got a few nights ago. If there aren't any supernovae bright enough for you, keep an eye on this list until a brighter one comes along. To subscribe to the current list, select Subscribe from the Setup menu and select the ones you want to receive updates for. They'll be checked daily and they'll be downloaded if they've been updated. You can also force them to update by clicking the Update Now button if you don't want to wait. These subscriptions are all free with Sky Tools. And there you have it. Clear skies, and thanks for watching.